I started my career at Goldman Sachs. Then I moved to Credit Suisse, onto Bluecrest Capital, and latterly spent the, the remaining portion of my career at UBS running the macro division. In order to survive, I needed to be incredibly single-minded. I developed a mechanism of parking stuff, i.e. the ability to shut off emotion. This has been useful in some respects, that I was able to act as if I had a suit of armor on because I didn't feel bits and pieces and probably gave me an edge here and there in my, in my career. But what it wasn't good for was personal relationships and my ability to, if I, if I don't want to engage with someone, I have an ability to shut them out. The only thought of thing I thought of doing was getting a job with a bank with a trading room. I didn't know anything about it. So I, yes, I would have done that. How Would I have been as single-minded and unpleasant <laughs> as I found myself to be, which largely suited the environment at the time? No, I don't think so. And would I have failed of a consequence? Well, that's an interesting question. Today, our guest is David Tate. David has sat at the top table of the trading world. He started his career at Goldman Sachs in the mid-1980s, where he quickly established himself as one of their top FX traders. David spent 12 years at Goldman's, eventually becoming their head of proprietary trading. David went on to have an illustrious trading career, which involved stints in trading and risk leadership at firms such as UBS, Credit Suisse and Bluecrest Capital. Today, three and a half decades on from when he started, David is CEO of the World Gold Council. David's brilliant career as a trader was however marred by a dark secret which was holding within him for many years and which burned away at him, paradoxically driving his success, yet killing the joy which went with this and which impacted his life by harming the people around him and those who came close to him. Later in David's career, after a series of traumatic events which saw him try to take his life and nearly lose the people that mattered most to him, David started to come to terms with his past. As part of this process, David became a prolific campaigner and fundraiser. As part of his efforts to raise money, he started engaging in a series of activities which included five successful ascents of Mount Everest. One of only a handful of people to have achieved this. David's efforts to date have raised over one and a half million pounds, equivalent to over two million dollars, for a number of children's charities. David has done two interviews with us, which have coincided to help promote a major new British film about David's life called Sulphur and White. The film, made by one of the industry's top directors and with an all-star cast, had a royal premiere last week and goes on release this week at the Everyman chain of cinemas across the UK. In this first interview, David tells his story in his words. He shares some insights into what it was like to be him in this world and how he dealt with the dark secret of his past. He also describes how this fueled his trading success but also his life's failures. We are conscious that our usual audience of traders and investment professionals may find the subject matter somewhat off the beaten track of our normal interview themes and topics. However, we ask you to stay with this as the relevance of this unfolds as David tells his story. To put some more flesh on that last sentence, as anyone who's ever been a trader knows, it is a fully immersive experience. Your work as a trader and your life are inseparable. There are some jobs where it is relatively easy to separate work and life. But anyone who's ever traded will tell you that trading is not one of them. As a trader, you bring your whole self to the role. And your whole self is formed from every stage of your past, much of it unconscious and hidden from view. And when you leave the office or depart from the screens, you never fully leave the role. And there are many wives, husbands and partners of people who have worked in trading, who will have their own experiences of being on the other side of a trader's life. There will also be many people listening from other areas and fields. And we are aware that many of the themes in this interviews are universal and can be applied to people from all walks of life and professions. Before the interview, a quick thank you to our sponsor, the Society of Technical Analysts the STA. The STA is one of the world's leading bodies in the field of technical analysis education. 
They deliver world-class diplomas, programs and technical analysis courses. You can find out more about them and their services by visiting their website, sta-uk.org. Now, on with the podcast. Well, um, today we welcome David Tate uh, to Alpha Mind Podcast. Um, David has a journey that has been so interesting that a film is about to release about it. Um, and I think we're, we're here very much today to hear of, of this journey, of some of the real life challenges that are within it and how that steered to some extent, how David has evolved and how he is today. Um, the film that's going to be released is called Sulphur and White. Um, but we welcome David and, uh, David, we're, we're looking forward to this chat with the twists and turns and I'm sure the audience will be, um, hopefully inspired by some of the, the, the critical messages that come out of this chat today. So we, we welcome you to the podcast. Well, thank you. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, spread this message. And perhaps it's probably worth um, just, just a quick overview about where you are now, perhaps uh, what, you're, you're, what you're doing now, and perhaps um, a bit of a glimpse as to uh, uh, the, the, the journey that you've been on. And of course, we can go further into that as we, we go through this discussion today. Yes, uh, sure. Um, I am currently the CEO of the World Gold Council. I took over this in uh, January last year, officially at the uh, end of February last year. Um, it's a fascinating departure. I spent 35 years in investment banking. I started my career at Goldman Sachs for a dozen. Then I moved to Credit Suisse, onto Bluecrest Capital, a uh, brief stint at uh, Peloton Partners, UBS, and latterly spent the, the remaining portion of my career at UBS running the macro division. Uh, rates, commodities, FX, and all the e-businesses before leaving there in the middle of 16. Um, I well, contemplated returning to the city, but uh, at the same time, I spent an enormous amount of time uh, getting rid and firing an awful lot of people towards the latter part of my tenure. And I frankly didn't relish uh, with the, the capital constraints that were being imposed on the institutions, having to uh, go through all that again. And so I was uh, very lucky to have the World Gold Council uh, approach me. It was a very fascinating job. I get to look down giant holes, play with very giant orange trucks at one end of the spectrum. And the vast other end of the spectrum, I get to talk to really nice people like Mark Carney and Andy Haldane. Um, so um, the arch, the overarch is a, is a fascinating role. And, uh, um, um, far more, and frankly, in many respects, far more interesting and less binary than my original job was. So very happy. Um, in terms of my of this journey, yes, well, this is obviously outside the remit of my job, but at the same time, it's had some bearing on it and has been influenced by it in many ways. Um, when uh, back in when I was a, when I was a kid, something dreadful happened to me when I was around about ten years old, um, and uh, during the course of my teenage years, uh, there was awful lots of angst and struggle. Uh, but finally, I ended up uh, getting a job uh, when I joined Goldman Sachs um, in the early 80s. Um, at, uh, during the course of my working career, uh, in broad overview, I started making donations, doing sponsorship events, making donations to the NSPCC very discreetly. I think the very first thing I ever did was abseil down the outside of the Citibank building in Lewisham. I decided to do it face first to raise more money. Uh, and hence it went on. There were similar similar things. I tried racing cars, but was more adept at crashing them. I was throwing myself out of planes, skydiving, doing all sorts of things, generally trying to kill sheep from a great height, as my friends used to call it, until eventually I stumbled across, while I was sitting at my desk at Blue Cross Capital one day, I watched a contingent of Chinese climbers summit Everest in 2003. And they did it with great fanfare, and they, they broadcast in glorious color from the very summit, and that was 50 years celebration of Hilary Tenzing's first summit and Her Majesty's the Queen ascension to the throne, coincident, coincident dates. And I looked up, looking for my next vehicle to raise money for the charity, and I thought, okay, that's what that's gonna be. And so I rocked up to Everest in 2005, uh, climbed it, and to my surprise, raised well over a quarter of a million pounds, 10 times what I expected. I decided in 2007, armed 
with this remarkable uh, vehicle now, which I thought was going to be pivotal, I decided just before my 2007 climb on my begging email that I would send to everybody that I, that I would disclose what had happened to me. And I think the reason I disclosed it was because I realized finally I had a chance to make a difference with the story and I had a chance to raise vast amounts of money if I got this right for the charity. So all I did was on the bottom of the email, I said, um, please help the NSPCC because uh, I was one of those children. And uh, that was monumental to me and uh, tiny to a lot of people. I expected the world to end, the sun not to come up. Uh, but when I walked in the office, nobody so much as flinched. I did the climb, very successful, came back. And because I was a bit physically beaten up, I had a few months off to recover. And I decided to try and write my story down. And, um, and so I wrote seven or eight chapters of climbing, uh, the 2007 climb. And I wrote seven or eight chapters of personal idiosyncratic stories from my past that I thought, in my mind at least, mapped back to what happened to me as a child. And I wove them together. I alternated them such that when you arrived at the summit in, in the climbing story, you arrived at the low point in the personal story. Well, I thought that was utter genius. Handed it to book agents who thought the exact opposite. They said, could you please get rid of all the climbing because it's really boring. Uh, but could you please write us 15 chapters of personal because that's what we're interested in. I declined. Um, but that manuscript, long story short, ended up in the hands of a guy who wanted to make movies. And here we are some 11 years later uh, with the Royal Premier, Royal Gala, I should say, Royal Gala being held on the 27th of February in front of um, Her Royal Highness, the Countess of Wessex, and all other city dignitaries, uh, a list, um, this list quite extensive people who, who have helped along the way, including Mr. Spencer, Michael Spencer, who handed me the ICAP floors for six straight days of filming as an example. Um, so yeah, an, an amazing grounds for the support behind me, which I'm immensely grateful for. Wow, that's, that's quite a story and um, quite an introduction and thank you. And um, um, just, just a very small mention and, and a thank you to uh, my great friend and one of your ex-work colleagues, Yasser Dalau, who introduced me to you. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I just feel we need to mention him. He's, <laughs> you know, he, he's a very, very old friend of mine. We used to work together. Um, and uh, he, he's a big supporter of of your work and the film itself. And I think he told me he's he's managed to get himself a ticket to the premiere. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, the self proclaimed Barry White of foreign, foreign exchange, as he calls himself, which I found hysterical when he first did that. But a great <laughs> friend of mine for donkey's years. Um, he's the only person who looks after me and insults me at the same time. To the nth degree, it's uh, as we I think we probably all know that, but uh, frankly, I've lent on him in many ways, uh, both professionally and personally, throughout my career. He's an amazingly qualified, smart individual, and to be honest, he's the only person who could probably compete with my wife as a counselor. Uh, I think he doesn't realize it, but he is a fully qualified, bona fide counselor, but doesn't know it. His support has been uh, four square, and yes, you're right, he did wangle himself two tickets to the premiere. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I, I worked with Yasser at Credit Suisse many years ago. <laughs> if I, I was there when he joined, and uh, right. he was placed next to me, and it was the start of a long, a long, long friendship. And uh, as you, you're saying, he's got this amazing ability to both make you laugh and insult you all in one <laughs> one sentence. Rare skill. True. Yeah, it's a unique skill. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And anyway, we're, m moving on. Can, can you tell us a little bit about the movie? Yes, Sovereign White. It's an unusual name, um, and it was it was derived by the writer, a lady called Susie Farrell, who I sat with for hundreds of hours, to be honest. Um, I think Susie Farrell, apart from being a gifted writer, also doubles as an MI5 interrogator because um, she managed to extract the, uh, the D DNA of the story from me over thousands of hours. She wasn't content with any faffing around or me trying to glamorize it in a to sort of a James Bond style story. She she went to the she cut really to the to the quick. Um, sulfur and white is a type of butterfly. And um, when I was a kid, when I was ten years old, I was locked into a 
into a storeroom of a shop and um, I was uh, the, the store owner had seen me try and steal a bar of chocolate and uh, when he saw me do that he asked me to put it back as I turned to do so I was punched from behind in the head I ended up on the ground and uh, my clothes were all ripped off and I was I was raped by him um, over the course of the subsequent few months uh, him and his friends used me in this room for about I think as I remember it four to five months it was definitely the whole summer uh, before my parents found us a house and we moved away these butterflies could be seen on a bush outside the door of this store and I used to focus on the butterflies to distract me and so um, yeah that's where the name comes from um, she stumbled across it in many respects I remember mentioning it during the discussions but the, the, the rather beautiful name is also incredibly uh, poignant because sulfur on the one hand infers hell and white in first heaven and uh, purely accidental but i just think it's we've ha she has landed on the most beautiful of names and luckily it's idiosyncratic so largely doesn't tell you the story before you show up and watch the film so let's so, uh, you've, you've almost got the, the events you've described have then gone on to i suppose shape every part of your life yeah I um, it creates a, a, a type of person um, to be honest you you go through your teenage years you wonder as you learn what happens to you what's happened to you at first you don't understand really um, but somehow some way you understand that it wasn't good and then you understand the mechanics and then you start worrying and uh, and of course my father was involved in this and so we lived in a, a house together. My mother discovered him um, at a later stage, um, which, as we will be shown in the film, it's all it's all perfectly narrated in the film. And eventually, um, so I cut him out of my life uh, for a very long period um, as I as I grew older, and my mother as well, which I regretted enormously because she became immensely ill and uh, and died as a consequence of it which I, I firmly placed the blame for that at my own door. Um, and of course, we have Dugray Scott in the film playing my father, bravely, I have to say, and um, Anna Friel playing my mother. Um, and she captures that role to a T, I have to say. Um, very bizarre moment for me rocking up on filming on the very first day at um, the building behind Liverpool Street. And watching her dressed up as my 54 mother on set was just one of the most mind-blowing experiences of my life, to be honest. Because you couldn't tell them apart. It was quite a, quite a shocking experience. But yes, uh, it has fashioned everything. It fashions the manner in which I interacted with people, the, 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 the depths of emptiness you have, the feeling of personal disdain you have, uh, your need to harvest love and affection from people to keep your, keep your self-esteem afloat. All these things have bearing not only on yourself, but most importantly, as I've alluded to earlier on, on the people around you. Um, you don't mean to take people on a miserable journey with you. You really don't. But inevitably you do. And you are responsible for that. And um, my hope from this film is that people will understand that you don't really mean to, but nor should you be excused for the damage you do. Interesting. Can I ask, David, has, has the film actually, have you found it help you in, in you know, a, a, this part of the journey now? Have you found that this, this retelling of the story uh, has been difficult for you or has actually been, uh, been of use for you? Well, back in 2010, the charity out of, by pure chance, this is another one of these pure chance moments that led to all this, um, the charity asked me, would I be prepared to tell people about what happened to me? And at that point, nobody bar my wife knew in any, any, any of the detail, anything. Just, just people knew that I put that thing on that email. 
and I wrote, I wrote the speech and I tried to, I designed the speech, which many people have heard now, which was half Everest story that goes terribly wrong. And I, I make everybody laugh and ooh and ah, because it's a bit of a gory, funny story. And essentially what I do is I lull people into a false sense of security and then I blindside them with the, with the true story. And that's intentional. So it's meant for speech, it's meant for charity events, it's meant to grab people, meant to get attention. And I didn't realize how few people were talking about their experiences until I spoke about my own. That's what became a surprise to me. And coupling that with the amount of money I was making and the fact, this realization that I could do something, once I realized there was a story that I could, I could move the, the needle has driven this. But has giving, uh, has giving us these speeches repetitively been made it easier for me? No, I get as dry mouthed and I call it the Jacob's cracker mouth every single time, every time. My legs shake so violently when I give that speech. I'm constantly amazed people can't see it. I don't think, I think there's been one peculiar moment where I was calm all the way through. I still to this day don't know why, but most of the time I'm shaking like a leaf. Has it been cathartic? No, not at all. And I did expect it to be. What has been cathartic, though, has been the number of people who have contacted me as a consequence of talking. And I've used this, this analogy before, that inside a person like me, there is a bucket of self-esteem. And I would, if you don't mind me saying, most people have a pretty full bucket of self-esteem. When you suffer something that I did, you don't. You have a hole, a permanent hole, and it, it drains away all the time. Because every time you open your eyes, you think of it empty. When every time during the course of the day you get distracted, it fills up. Then when you, when you go home and you start thinking about things again, it empties out again. And what I found that climbing Everest in 2005 filled my bucket, and for some reason it stayed full for six months. So I thought, oh, I'm onto something here. Not only had I done something that made myself feel good, but also the people, everybody was getting, I was helping on the guy giving these speeches. And I can say, largely speaking now, that bucket has been sealed. But it's been through the self-worth I've derived from the good, and that sounds terribly holier than now, it's not meant to be, from the good I've actually managed to do. Every time I go to a, I give a speech in front of six or 700 people, probably 40 people on average come up to me in tears saying, thank you, I've not had the confidence to say anything, but thank you for doing it. And I never expected to be virtually, virtually, I only know two other people who talk about their experiences. I've only seen two other people do it. And I find that understandable, but the low number is still a bit of a surprise to me. And so I became trapped. They asked me, I said, yes, I did it. I spoke. And then, of course, I couldn't stop. The same way I couldn't really stop climbing that dark mountain. I kept going back. You know, do I like climbing? No, it's, it's horrible. It's cold. It's miserable. I'm lonely. But, you know, you get it done. You come home. You raise the money. You, you shout. You scream. And, and because I was raising so much money, I, I felt I couldn't really stop. And then 2017, actually, I think myself, my, 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 my sell-by date was reached because... <laughs> I think having climbed K2 in 15, and when I went back to do Everest, most people went, oh, for God's sake, give it a rest. And um, uh, the interest dropped away completely. And I would, uh, they gave me an opportunity to actually stop, thank God. Um, so yes, it's helped, but not in the way you would imagine. I, I'm, 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 you know, I'm so moved by what you've been saying. Um, and um, I'm, I'm pretty sure our audience out there will be as well. Um, I, I'm just thinking as you're talking here, um, you, you've talked to audiences about this. You've raised a lot of money and had film made now about this. Um, but th this is you in your own words now talking about this. And, and I mean, there, there feels something very powerful about this. And you said earlier on, or just a few moments ago, that when you've given talks, you've had people come up to you occasionally, not very often. Um, one of the things that we've noticed with this podcast, we, we've done a few episodes on um, on trauma within this role. Um, we, we've had an episode where we talked to a trader who suffered a mental breakdown. 
on the trading floor. Um, and, and after all those episodes, we, we have people contact us from all over the world um, with various messages, sometimes just saying thank you. Um, when they spoke to Simon a few weeks ago, when we had the episode with Simon, the, the uh, trader who had the mental breakdown is now a psychotherapist, um, saying he'd had traders reach out directly to him from across the world. Um saying that they found his story so powerful and and um and that they resonated with that and I think I think that may happen after we've um after we broadcast this podcast and it stays on the record. So it, and and I guess, you know, if one person benefits from that, it, it's gonna be a help for them. Um and if thousands of people benefit from that, it's gonna be a help for thousands. Um, so that there feels a little bit of something about this episode that feels a little bit of mission about it. But I, I, I'm really curious. Um, in that sense, you you, you want to get this story out there as widely as possible. And I know we spoke before we started this podcast about about what you want from this. Uh, and maybe I, I found when you answered that question very powerful. And maybe you could just share with the audience. Again, what what you would like from this podcast and from what you're doing? Yeah. Well, uh, as I, I you know, I've thought a lot about what I'm going to be saying in front of that royal audience on the 27th. Um, we have worked very, very hard to make sure that that audience are the most influential individuals we can find. As I alluded to, even Mike Spence is coming, and you know. There's bosses of this, bosses of that, it's great. Because I've reached out to a number of companies, probably 20 to 25 companies, including Lance Ugler at Market, who's graciously helping, uh, the, uh, James Stewart, KPMG, all of the, the top guys, um, Richard Burley and at ICAP, as an example. They've all, they've all lent into this at my request, I've sat down opposite them all, I've, I've explained the story, they've seen the trailer, they, they understand. And once, once they had spoken to me, they've all decided that they will do what they can to raise awareness. When I showed up, it wasn't to ask them for money, we made, we made the film. But it was um, to, can, we, can I access your channels, your social media channels, your staff? Can I engage with them? Would you help me engage with them such that they, they understand that this story is out there and understand why um, transmitting it wide and wide, wider and wider and wider advantages so many people. And I hope um, uh, that that is what people uh, buy in and understand. You know, I, I could go on forever, the, the, list of people, the list of individuals, but crucially what I want from this is enough people to see it such that it becomes a genre-defining film. Now, I'm not saying that that means it needs to win prizes and all that, all that rather superfluous stuff. If it becomes acknowledged, as you know, we can all think of films that become pivotal to a, sub, a, a subject matter. I remember thinking Private Ryan was the best war movie I ever saw, as an example. And you think, okay, that's the one I always think of. I would like this film, hypothetically, to be thought of in that vein. I would like it to be a, a, a textbook. I'd like it to be the go-to place. Um, I would like it to maybe kick off a sequence of people having the guts to put their own messages out there and um, ultimately changing the face of child sexual abuse. Now, I do not believe that you can cure child sexual abuse. I really wish I could say you could. I believe it's a very unfortunate part of human nature, and I don't believe there is an adequate deterrent. It's some form of chemical quirk that allows this to happen in us. But what we can do, and what I hope this film will do, is destigmatize sexual abuse. I want it to be regarded, if you can understand the way I'm thinking, in the same way we regard common assault. I'm not saying it's less that it's not as important as it is i'm saying that we need to allow people who suffer this violence 
and they will always suffer this violence, back to my earlier point, well, I want them to recover quicker because it's not considered the most devastating thing that can happen to you the way it is regarded now. I've worked hard with the charity and the charity's worked extremely hard with me to make sure that every child in every school in the UK is educated about sexual abuse by the time they're 10. They chose 10, I believe, because that was my age, which is a lip service to me, which is nice. But the child now knows what's coming by the time they're 10, and they know how to respond if it happens after that age. That's a huge advantage. My wife is a counsellor at Childline. They get 45 to 50,000 calls a year now. You stand there and the phone rings every three seconds. It's shocking. But I'm not saying we can mitigate that. We should try, but I'm not saying we can. But if we can, if we can make people understand and get help earlier, you don't have to go through 30 to 35 years of misery, which I largely went through on a personal level. But more importantly, I wouldn't have had to put so many other people through the same misery. And that's the point. You know, the things my wife has suffered, and uh, she's, a, she's the epitome of the, 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 the tagline from the movie, which is love is an act of endless forgiveness. She's walking, living embodiment of that phrase. And uh, I couldn't be more grateful. But that's what I want from the film. Education on what sexual abuse is. There are many smart people out there who still don't know. It's very hard to understand, but it's absolutely true. The second thing, as I've said, the collateral damage. You go through life devastating everybody around you, either non-caring or caring, and just don't caring either. And the last thing is that for me, I was lucky enough to find this woman who kept me upright eventually but for children now we have this nspcc in charity that should catch them early enough couple that with making them understand that it's not it's not the end of the world you know your life doesn't need to be destroyed from that point on that's what i want from this film and i want people to understand that and if we can imagine david if, if, if a young you let's say had had the opportunity to see this film. Would, would that have, looking back on, on the early days of you, um, I guess that would radically change your, your, your journey um, if you'd had this sort of education yourself. This is, yeah, this is notwithstanding the films of 15. Yes, it would, uh, if I'd seen it at that age, I would have understood a lot more about myself. I would have, I would have understood, it would have, it would have charted a, a future it would have demonstrated to me what to avoid um even before i blundered into the things i did uh you if if there had been a message attached to the end of the film such as there is to this one where i could have learned that there was help there and not to not to continue blindly and default left uh, it gives you an opportunity to turn right of your own accord and not default left Yes, I would have. I would have been in a much better place. Um, and certainly, the people who have been unfortunate enough to blunder into me over the last last thirty years would have been in a much better place too. Do you think you'd have got into a city role? Yes, I do because I, I, I would have gone. Yeah, because I, my father would. I was in the city, and I. I that's all I knew. Um, he worked for Lloyd's Bank International long before that became someone else. And uh, so I knew I knew trading rooms existed I, in the ether somewhere in the back of my mind. I I always knew. And when I left school, I worked in a hamburger restaurant for six months, living the life. Twenty three girls and me, the chef. It wasn't too bad. I enjoyed myself. But uh, some, you know, I knew I needed to get a job. And the only thought of thing I thought of doing was getting a job with a bank with a trading room. I didn't know anything about it. So I, yes, I would have done that. How, would I have been as single-minded and unpleasant <laughs> as I found myself to be, which largely suited the environment at the time? No, I don't think so. And would I have failed of a consequence? Well, that's an interesting question. I've got, I've got a question which follows on from Mark's question there. I've, my, my own mentor as a coach and my own coach, when I was a trader, was a guy called Peter Burdett. I know Peter. 
we've had a discussion about a topic where we've both noticed individuals who have suffered early life traumas somehow seem to have a suit of armour when it comes to trading <laughs> that we feel makes them better traders. Um, and I know you've alluded to this both in articles and, and something we spoke about before we started. So I, I guess that was one thing I wanted to talk about. And another one was, you know, how did you deal with this in, you know, and myself and Mark have both worked in the industry for, I think, between us, like over seven decades. And it, it's such a macho male, alpha male industry in so many ways. And, and it, how did that play out for you in terms of what you'd been to, how you entered that industry? what you faced. And I think that was a big part of the movie as well. Yeah. Well, the macho element of it. Yeah. It's, I came into that, that world. I think I was always, I was always, now let me back just fractionally up in order to survive the suit of armor, I needed to be incredibly single minded. I developed a mechanism through the, my teenage and early 20s of parking stuff, i.e. the ability to shut off emotions. I have used the phrase to many before, I have my own little lock-up garage in my brain that I can put something in, I park it in there and I close the door. And I open it whenever I need to open it or I'll, when I choose to, but I, I have the ability to keep that shut. Now. This has been useful in some respects to your point that I was able to act as if I had a suit of armor on because I didn't feel bits and pieces and probably gave me an edge here and there in my, in my career. But what it wasn't good for was personal relationships and my ability to, if I, if I don't want to engage with someone, I have an ability to shut them out and I do that, that mechanism is great from a corporate perspective because if we want to get something done, I have the ability to see through anybody or anything to get it done. That's, what, that's, that's good. The bad of that, as I've tried to allude to, is that you miss everybody in between and you leave wreckage and damage along that route that you, that you can't, that you don't see. You choose, you've chosen not to see, let's be honest because you want to get the objective. I sometimes call it the Alexander Haig complex. Yeah. Where, you know, how many people, well, it doesn't matter how many people, how, sir, you're going to lose a million. Wait, I, I, I don't want to know the details. Just let's, let's take that trench. So my brain can go to that Alexander Haig mode because I had to protect myself. I wasn't, I didn't want to think about this stuff. And so I parked every, everything emotional in there, but I achieved what I want to achieve. So, yeah, I mean, that macho environment, I, I played the part. I, I was that person, I really was, because I distanced myself from all the emotional side and carried on remorselessly. There was also another element to this, was, which was you, 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 you chase um, relationships. You chase the you want to be told by people that you are number one. You want to be regarded as number one and uh, by women and you. And so that was very much in tune with this macho element. I certainly didn't look out of place in that environment to say the least. I, I fitted it perfectly, I have to say, <laughs> and, uh, which is a bit lamentable, but there were, there were very good reasons why I was doing that at the time. It's almost like, the environment was made for you yeah. um, but there's there's a consequence to that as well um, which, which as you said you know you, you left almost a trail of damage behind you and, and I think that was I, I got a sense that was part of what you want a lot of the viewing public for this film to understand that there's there's two sides to to this abuse there's one directly the victim but then there's almost like the secondary victims which is almost everyone else that seems to come into touch with that person on a close level that's exactly right it's 
you know, you've, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, the abuser become the, the abused becomes the abuser. And we've heard that before. And I find that bizarre and abhorrent at a physical level. I don't, I can't imagine, you know, although there are instances of, of someone who's been abused becoming an abuser physically. I don't, I can't reconcile myself with that. But I can reconcile with the, with uh, there being a viral effect from emanating from a childhood incident that changes one's personality so to such an extent that you it dominates many lives around you, uh, around me, and others, and to the point. Um, and I'd like to just return to this thing: is the fact that this I, 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 it's going to be virtually impossible, but I, I'd almost want to differentiate between me, the person here, and the story, the message I'm trying to put out. And by its nature, I'm going to I'm the person people are going to talk to. But if I, I want to reference this as almost like a reference book. I want people to look at this and look at the examples and say, well, okay, now I see how this mechanism works. I want to take that away. It's not about David per se. It's about that's what happened. Look at the repercussions this guy had. He was lucky enough to have this amazing woman, but in real terms, now we have the charity. And that's what I, but I think the bit most people do not understand is that middle portion, that viral effect and the damage it has on so many other, other people's lives. And, uh, you know, how, Awful a parent I've been, and uh, awful a husband I've been at times, and all those things. Um, and yet, I'm sure there's, there's there's probably a million families out there right now struggling with this. Who I'm hoping, if not more, who I'm hoping will be able to cross reference with this film and find some comfort and some solace in it. The aspect that gets that gets forgotten, the secondary sort of victims of. Of of what happened to to you, or what happens to anyone, and as you say, you don't just want to make this about you. You want to make this, I suppose, in a sense, you're the focal point for this. But for people to go out and think, you know, that there are uh, potentially a million yous out there, and some of them, I suppose, some, you know, you 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 very got very close to taking your own life, and, and but for the intervention of a couple of policemen. You know that there are so many people that face this dilemma, and I think who have, you know, like li- I don't know, does life become so unbearable, or, or is there something else? I mean, I, I, you know, is it you look away from the pain you're inflicting on others? I, I, I don't know. It's, but it, it's such a great point that you're raising here. And I, I'm... Yeah, I mean, I very much regard myself as uh, all in, to coin a poker phrase at this point. Um, the the mental health elements of this um, couldn't be raised at a, at a more important time, which is more luck than judgment. But you know, hopefully, someone's looking over us and looking down on us, and you know, making sure this works. But yeah, I I did back in many many years ago now, ninety three, I think, rocked up at uh, BG Head one morning, having lost my family and my mother the same weekend. And my mother uh, basically starved herself to death. And it was, um, it was just one of those moments that you do confront. Uh, uh, and um, I showed up at Beachy Head. I got myself a cup of coffee at this little, little cafe. And there was this um, little, ta- little piece of paper on the wall that was raising 200 pounds for charity. And they'd raised 50. And I, in Goldman Sachs style largesse, I gave her 150 quid to fill, to, to fill it up and uh, took the coffee, sat back down and walked out. And um, this lady had called the police thinking that that 150 pounds was my last will and testament. And I think she was probably, probably right. And um, long story short, I ended up in this police cell in Eastbourne uh, with a clock that chimed every 15 minutes. And it seemed like I was in there for years, let alone one afternoon. And during the course of that afternoon, I had to confront a number of things. One of which was, I was, I was on, at the cusp, having sitting in, sitting in front of this delightful doctor, I was on the cusp of losing absolutely everything. The, the juxtaposition of worrying about the fact that I was suddenly about to lose everything sitting in this cell, 
and having been an hour ago standing on a cliff, didn't pass me by. But I'd realized in that moment that I didn't want to depart. And in that, in that moment, I was going to use what had happened to me, like I said, as a weapon. I was not going to let those people uh, from the past in that room continue to dictate to me. But in all honesty, did I, did it, wasn't it an epiphany? Was it, was it bravery? Was it heroism and it turned the corner for me? No. What it was, was downright terror. I was sitting in a police cell, pleading with them to let me continue with my life. And it's only when you're, you decide, when you're confronted with something so brutally austere as that moment, that you realize that you're making a choice whether you want to live or die in that moment, not on the cliff, but in that cell. And I did, I realized then I did. And that they captured that beautifully in the film. I think it's, um, I, was, I was immensely pleased with what Julian Gerald had created there. Um, they captured it perfectly and then I, then I got my act together. And I've always looked back upon that point as, um, you know, uh, I decided in that moment more than anything that I would never, ever, 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 ever give up on anything ever again, no matter what it was. And that doesn't mean to say I wouldn't fail anything. <laughs> you do. But it doesn't mean that I would never give up on anything ever again. And, um, and I think that I think is an important thing for people in my circumstance to take away as well. Um, it's, it, it, you, you get these shots at life and um, it's only when you realize you almost didn't have it that it becomes valuable to you. So yeah, it's in, in one respect, that was probably one of the hardest filming days um, because it was humiliating. And at the same time, one of the most important parts of the film. It was then that I started really dedicating to thinking more about the charity, uh, writing checks. As I learned more and more, it was nice, that helpful. I would do uh, different things. Like I said, I've done motor racing badly, skydiving badly, uh, most things badly, but you don't have to do them well to raise the money. You just have to keep throwing yourself out. And then, of course, about in the early 2000s, that's when the climbing started, when I was starting to run out of ludicrous things to, to do. I found the ultimate ludicrous thing to do, really, which was slap up and down a giant rock. But I found that mentally I was in a better place. It wasn't, it wasn't an overnight transformation by any means. Um, I uh, re-met Vanessa in uh, 1995, again, just a couple of years after this, this point. That was like being injected with happy fluid because uh, that's what she does to people. And she sent me a card on Valentine's Day, it did make me laugh, which said, uh, I'm one in a million. <laughs> which, uh, with the truth of it being that um, I'm, I'm certain that not one day goes past that Vanessa doesn't think, I wish I'd chosen one of the other 999,999. I'm certain of that. And I think in her quieter moments, she will own up to that. But she didn't. She chose me and she got stuck with me. And um, I'm immensely grateful. But those years up to 2000 were, were, were fun, were buoyant. I moved, uh, set up a hedge fund with a friend of mine, Simon Gillis, very good friend of mine, who's coming to the premiere. I lasted a year because I'd gone from a, being a very large wheel, hang on, is that what, large cog in a large wheel at Goldman Sachs, the focal point of the room, the dollar mark trader, the proprietary trader, you know what it's like, um, total alpha male, alpha squared male, to be honest. And suddenly I was sitting in a, in a four by square office in St. James's, listening, listening to, uh, Simon snore most of the time, he won't mind me still. <laughs> yeah, and um, I, I, I couldn't do it. And um, it wasn't that. It was just I, I, was, I was used to more interaction. It was a fantastic year, but I was used to more humans. And um, I had too much time to think. I think that might be what it was. So I ended up back at Credit Suisse, uh, running the proprietary desk there, which was great, back in an environment I knew and loved, honestly. Um, I fed off. I should say really 
And then uh, Mike Platt and Bill Reeves sucked me into Bluecrest at, at Inception, just after Inception, which was rather nice. Six or seven of us in St. James's, sorry, German Street. And of course, my life was completely and utterly 101 miles an hour every day. Um, but, and the bit I always struggle with every day, like almost now, is the bit between when I finish work and I go home. It's when it stops. And I've got to find something else to think about. I'm, I'm good when I'm frantic and busy and, and literally my bandwidth is stretched. I don't have time to think about stuff. Uh, but ironically, the hardest bit, in fact, the hardest bit is between my station and my house when I get stuck in traffic in a car that drives me mental because uh, all I've got is my own head to think. Um, but yeah, the job has been a pain, but also the thing that has kept me relevant and alive and um, engaged. And I have a lot to thank it for, not, not least the money, that, that goes without saying. I've met some incredible people. I have been blessed with some incredible bosses over the years. Most notably, I would say Mike Platt and Bill Reeves, who are incredibly generous men and with their time as well as their, their finances for sponsoring me. Uh, Carsten Kingetta at UBS, um, a stunning individual, um, one of the kindest, and Gail Dubrissard at, uh, at Credit Suisse. And they know I mean that. I'm not persona. I've got no obligation other than they're now my friends. Um, but incredibly broad-minded individuals who let me disappear, throw myself up a mountain, come back once every two years, raise a ton of money, engage people in the firm. They knew also, I think, that it, it gave me an opportunity to, I don't know, reset my brain a bit. And, uh, incredibly kind uh, individuals and a credit to the industry, if you don't mind me saying. Yeah, and I think that's a a major point in terms of managing oneself to have these social networks and this social connectivity uh, and not being sort of isolated or you know sort of inward focused but having a, a connectivity to everything that's going around you probably was part of almost certainly the, the ongoing healing if that's the right word you mentioned earlier on that the, the this job is 100 miles an hour it's full on it does completely stretch your bandwidth and then you go to these quiet points and it's it's interesting for me because i guess you know not not and this is where many people may not understand you know the quiet points if you're someone who perhaps hasn't suffered a trauma fortunately you're not going to have these thoughts and these these reflections rush in at these points and it sounds like that may have been part of your your challenge and, and therefore, maybe you needed tactics which you developed to work with that. And, and I know this is something that Mark does in his work, where um, he does corporate mindfulness, although he, he calls it mind fitness, which is really you know, how to manage the mind um, in a way that strengthens it and make, makes it um, capable, really, to, to manage yourself every day. Uh, and it sounds like that must have been a big part of your challenge and a big part of of your personal battle yeah and i think i think vanessa is probably the person who has has had to suffer through that um almost a split personality i mean i suppose she must see it as she gets she off up and says i get the real you uh the rest of the world gets you know a different version um like i come to work i'm fully engaged i'm doing a, i'm performing a role i'm and i think the important word is performing I think you do. I think you at work, you you act in a certain manner, and I would say that most people, when they get out of work and they get home and they get changed and they plonk down and for want of a better expression, they shed off. They shed the any any pretense and or whatever it might be, any image. And probably your wife knows you better than most people outside the house knows you, sort of thing. That's what I'm saying. And, but, but for me, instead of my transformation being a suit to a, a, a set of sweaties and a TV and a, and a drink, I would generally plummet I, historically to a level where I could totally imagine that was very, I know, it was very testing for her. Um, and of course, all she got was the bit, the, the miserable so-and-so coming in through the door. 
um, by miserable, I don't mean miserable in, in normal person's terms. I mean, frankly, the mood of the house would change. And I'm saying that in general, I think that probably happens in most households, but at a, at a margin, probably not a lot of difference between the work and the, and the down. Definitely a different person. You shed the person you are at work sometimes and you, 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 you reveal yourself, you're, you're at home, you're a different guy. Uh, you know, we're all a bit different when we get home. That's an important point, though. You know, we, we talked about this mental health earlier on as being an issue that many people suffer. Um, w- when I coach, I, I coach people now, I coach traders and managers, and um, I, I try and ask them when I start working with them if it's possible to have a, a short conversation with their, their wife or their husband or their partner just to try and get their perspective on the individual because they'll know, know that person in a, in a different way. Um, my wife, when I was a trader... She only revealed afterwards that sometimes she would dread me arriving home because the whole atmosphere of the house would change and and she could literally tell from the way the car pulled into the drive and and, uh, the the key ran into the door, whether I'd had a good day or a bad day, (laughs) whether a large client had had, had, had committed a drive-by on on one of my books and uh, one of my positions had gone horribly wrong. Uh, And it was the same with Simon a few weeks ago when he talked about the mental breakdown that he was suffering when he was on the trading floor, that it was kind of his wife who raised the issue that he first realised it, that he said he'd become, you know, he'd become really distant and wasn't there for the family. And and there's one sense of that this job does that, and I'm sure many jobs do, but it it seems to have its own unique footprint in in that part of it. And then there's the other side for... As you say, it was far more extreme in your case because because of your backstory and your history and what you were carrying. I remember in the job coming home sometimes and having having had bad days, and you're you're almost resentful. You're resentful of the fact that you've gone through it. You're resentful of the fact you're coming home. You're resentful of the fact you've got this pile of bricks and this family who are there. Well, you are responsible for which means that you're going to go and have to go back and do it again. And I remember sometimes, if I'm honest, thinking of my family, oh God, if I didn't, if I didn't have to look after all this stuff, I wouldn't, I could, I'm always blaming my bad day on the fact that this lot are making me having to go back the following day and do it again. In a, in a roundabout, convoluted, bizarre thing in my head, I would hold them responsible for the anger I was feeling as if, if they vanished, I wouldn't have to go and do the job. Well, uh, my, my, I remember doing this sometimes. I remember doing it, and Vanessa turning me, turning around to me and saying, "Don't care if you got the job or not. Throw it, bin it, walk away, do what you want to do. Become a pilot, big gardens. I don't care. It's you, David, who are putting yourself under this pressure. Don't blame us." <laughs> and I think, as ever. Annoying as she sometimes is, she hit the nail on the head. And um, uh, so, yes, you, you, do, you do bring it home. I remember doing it myself. But the distinction I was trying to make between bringing it home and bringing it home was that I had that part of it, no doubt, like everyone else. But I also had this, when my mind was no longer occupied, burden that I would invariably drift into this. It would become compounded. The normal woes and stuff that's going through your head becomes compounded many times over because you sit in the car and you stare in traffic out the window and my mind goes to that. I can't help it. You know, it's a long time ago now, but it still happens. You still reflect. You just never forget it. And... um, it comes with its own sets of feelings, which are, I'm not sure the words have been described that are adequate to describe the way you feel about yourself. You should be brave and uh, wise enough and smart enough to be able to say, oh my God, it wasn't my fault. Yeah, 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 yeah. All that explanation. Uh, physically, it's over, but there's still a unique, unique feeling inside you you can't shed. Did you ever think... Or, I mean, at those points, these other people have no idea what I've been through. How dare they talk about X to me or worry about such minor things? Or Yeah, I mean, I would say 
probably latter years, particularly the last the last five years at Credit Suisse, when I was sitting in boardrooms or governance committee meetings, stressing about capital or lack of it at Credit Suisse, and uh, <laughs> and I'd be sitting around boardrooms um, with watching watching very nice ordinary people going grey with worry over their CET1 ratio and their, their risk metrics and their bar this and their, oh my god what are we going to do um, and equities wanting more capital over here and RWA over here and I was arguing to the like the people losing years of years of their life with this panic and I would sit there sometimes and I'd look at them and I would be thinking exactly what you just said which is you guys have got no idea <laughs> what what you're really saying here. How trivial, in the grand scheme of things, what it is this discussion. It's important. It's a job, but at the same time, you've got no idea how silly this sounds to me. You get, I got the job done. But yeah, but it's a function. That's what it is. You know, I. I... I, I can't relate to you with that. Um, in that sense, I can only, I can only have a. Um, well, I can relate a little bit when I when I lost my sister about twenty years ago. Um, she she died well before her time, and um, that that is was that was what happened to me at that point. Everything else felt unimportant, and you know it was like you know I carried that around with me for for quite a long time. That you know what you're talking about really doesn't matter but it does matter you know it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. yeah you're right um, you know you, you you learn a different set of priorities when you've gone through something horrendous you just do and i you know it would be a combination of thinking about my childhood and stuff that none of them knew about and you know i've been up and down everest five times and many of my friends have died around me and holding bodies and bits of body and and when you go through extremes whether it be personal or whether it be extreme event like climbing and all that sort of stuff arguing about CET1 ratios and RWA doesn't feel very important you know what I mean? <laughs> we're very very um, delighted that David came on the show today and, and literally opened up his heart to you know the, the, this story um, some shock in there i mean some i think we all perhaps shed a tear during just listening to some of those things uh, and so we should you know and i think it does i think reflect that um you know out there in society there are a lot of people that have been in this situation and perhaps have not told their story or shared the story and i think this just shows that um actually sharing these things and telling these things um can actually help to to heal, perhaps, if that's the right word, but also to to help you sort of move on with different purpose. Um, and this new purpose that, that David has, uh, understanding the important things in life. And of course, we laugh at the RWAs and the <clears throat> such conversations that we all know about that go on in the city. And actually, there's bigger stories out there. And the bigger story is all about us uh, in our roles in, in family and society. And that give it that sense of giving back or giving to, you know, with the, the, the charity involvement, I think is just a, a different story altogether, but but such a positive. Um and understanding also our impact on others um is, is critical as we move through life because of course we can be the source of a problem for somebody else and perhaps not even realise it. And it does remind me of um of Will Young when I heard him speak on stage about his difficulties been in the creative industry, not so much in the city, but uh, he used to zip on a Batman suit when he felt that he had to protect himself from from from, from words, really. It was words that were hurting him, from what I understand. And in that Batman suit, he had a little window opened up that opened up to his heart. And he was very, very careful as to who he opened up that window to, um, to have that that to let them in on his life and have that conversation. So the idea of self-protection is uh, something that I think we've learned too today from David.
thank you once again to David Tate for being so open, giving, and brutally frank. As a reminder, the film about David's story is called Sulphur and White and goes on general release in the UK this week at the Everyman Cinema Group. I was fortunate enough to attend the premiere last week and it really is a special, brilliant and incredibly moving film and with some great scenes from Trading Environments, which many of our audience will relate to. I'm not sure if there's an international release planned at this time. However, if and when there is one, we will make sure all our followers on social media are fully informed. All profits from this film will be going to the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, the NSPCC. And if after listening to David's harrowing story today, you feel like making a donation to this fantastic cause, you can go to their website, nspcc.org.uk, and make a donation. Or you can go to Childline and make a donation to them. Childline is the organisation which David's wife, Vanessa, is now a counsellor for. We are aware from previous podcasts about themes such as mental health and trauma in the workplace that powerful and strong feelings can be evoked amongst our listeners. Some listeners in the past have reached out to us or to our guests to both share their own stories or even ask for help. We are conscious that the theme of today's podcast may provoke deep feelings for some. If you are affected or impacted by anything brought up in today's podcast, we have two psychotherapists who work with us and have worked with us in the past both of whom have experience working in and with people from financial markets and with past traumas. They are available for you to reach out to if you feel the need. The first one is Natasha Lewis, and she can be reached at natashalewiscounseling.com. The second one is a recent guest of our podcast, Simon Garcia, and he can be emailed at contact at gps-therapy.com. If you have found our podcast or any of the podcasts useful and valuable, please do take the time to rate and review us on iTunes or whichever podcast service you use. Ratings and reviews help raise our profile and allow others to find out about us. Please do also share this episode with friends and colleagues. The wider the distribution, the more people will hear David's message and the more people will learn about this vital and hugely important and under-discussed topic. They will also find out about the movie Sulphur and White and therefore sharing this episode will help raise awareness of child abuse and its after effects. If just one person is helped or saved by this podcast, then we have achieved its minimum aim. David will be our guest for a second interview next week. The conversation in our second podcast with David is more focused specifically on trading, where he will talk more in depth about aspects of fear, self and ego in trading, topics which are always of interest to traders. And it will be fascinating for traders, both professional and retail, to hear a perspective through the lens of someone who has experienced 35 years in the hot seat at some of the world's leading trading and investment firms. If you aren't already subscribed to the Alpha Mind podcast, you can go to iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts or Stitcher and subscribe and follow us from there so that you don't miss future episodes. You will certainly not want to miss some of the ones we have coming up in March, which include a former Navy SEAL commander who will be talking about fear and how you can use powerful mindfulness techniques to help you better manage yourself when faced with fear and anxiety. We also have the original Wendy from the primetime show Billions joining us in the form of Denise Show, who inspired the character Wendy and who has been both a trader herself and now works coaching traders at some of the leading investment firms in the world and also works with people from the world of sport on the mental aspects of high performance. You can also check out some of our past episodes, including last week's episode with the notorious rogue trader Nick Leeson which was coincided to time with 25 years since the collapse of Bearings Bank. We would like to once again thank our sponsor, the Society of Technical Analysts, who this show is produced in association with. The STA is one of the world's leading bodies in the field of technical analysis education. They deliver world-class diploma programs and technical analysis courses at some of the world's leading academic institutions, including the London School of Economics, King's College London and Queen Mary University. They also offer an outstanding home study course. You can find out more about them and their other services by visiting their website 
sta-uk.org. You can also find out more about us on our website, alpha-mind.net or alpha-mind.net. We also have a blog. The blog is alphamindblog.blogspot.com or just Google Alpha Mind blog. Alpha Mind also offer and deliver our own services which help improve trader and investment professional performance and extend to leaders, executives, managers and whole businesses. Our first one is our powerful one-to-one trader performance coaching program. These are based on programs we have delivered to leading traders and investment professionals over the past decade. You can find out more about these by hitting the link at the top of our blog page or email info at Alpha R Cubed. That is the word Alpha, the letter R and the word cubed.com. Alpha R Cubed also offer outstanding executive leadership and team coaching services. And you can learn more about them on their website, www.alphaRcubed.com. In addition, my co-host Mark Randall offers powerful workshop and transformative programs. His workshops and programs focus on helping people to optimize mindset, well-being and performance. Mark works with groups from traders right through to board members. And Mark's authentic and unique approach has become recognized as a powerful toolkit to transform the mind into a weapon. More than 25,000 people have benefited from Mark's training. For more details about him and his workshops, go to www.markrandallconsultancy.com. You can also connect with us via social media. My Twitter handle is at AlphaMind101 and Mark's is at AlphaMind102. We are also available to connect on LinkedIn, Stephen Goldstein and Mark Randall, or join our LinkedIn group, the AlphaMind Group. That just leaves us to say thank you once again for listening. And please do feel free to check out some of our past episodes and to make sure you join us in the future. Wishing everyone the best of luck this week. Thank you. Thank you.